Well, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about battle plans, and this is our final sermon in this series. Uh, I didn't intend on doing a series, but I just I got into it, and the Lord was like, now you need to keep going with this here. And this morning during worship, uh, the Lord was speaking to me, and he had said something to me I thought was interesting. And the, the, some people like their bondage. And that blew me away. And I was like, what? And he's like, some people like their bondage. No matter what you tell them, they like their bondage. They don't want to be set free. They, they don't want, and I was like, wow. Hadn't really thought of that, about that. But he said, it's true. If that's you, I want to encourage you to gain a dislike for your bondage. And you get that through spending time with the Father. You get that through spending time in his word, and you realize that the bondage that you're in actually is a distaste in the Father's mouth. And when you start having his heart and you start getting what he desires, then you understand that the bondage that you may be in is, is actually, he, he doesn't want you to be there. And we know that's a truth because you've heard me say this scripture over and over again, and that's he who the Son sets free is free indeed, right? Jesus came to set the captive free, so those that are in bondage, no matter what the bondage may be, I know pornography is a big one that we talk about uh, and, and the world talks about in the church, but that's not the only bondage out there, guys. There's plenty of other bondages out there that people are in. Some people are bound in fear. Um, Rochelle mentioned it this morning when she was speaking. There are lots of people that are bound in fear, and they feed off of the news. They feed off of what they're reading and what they're, they're bringing, and that just that enables them, and surprisingly, what the Lord's telling me is they enjoy that. We need to get to a point where we don't enjoy bondage, but we want to look for, and I know, I know there's other people that want to be set free, and they don't know how, or they're, they're in that process of becoming free. That's awesome, but if you like your bondage, that's a bad thing. And we want to get you to a point where you don't like the bondage anymore, but rather want to be set free by the bondage breaker. Amen? And I can tell you this right now, that every single person can be set free, no matter what the bondage is. Whether it is fear or alcohol, cigarettes, depression, whether it is pornography or um, a, a, a a gossiping tongue, whatever that bondage may be, something that goes on you know, in, in those lists, you can be set free. There is hope for you. Amen. All right. Battle plans part three, weapons of our warfare continued. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verses three through five is what we're going to be looking at this morning. So if you would, would you please stand with me as we read from the word of the Lord? Second Corinthians 10, three through five. It was interesting when I was putting this message together. Uh, I'll tell you this, I build my messages, I use uh, iCloud. How many here use iCloud? All right, three of us, great, okay. So I went to go log on to iCloud and it wouldn't let me on. It said an internal er uh, er server error and I clicked on the help button and it showed that everything was up. And I tried a number of times and finally I was like, all right, I'll just do this on my computer. So I went and built it there. But in that process, I, I wasn't able to build my PowerPoint online. Hence, you get the nice, pretty screen there this morning. So if you brought your Bibles, you can turn to me with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. That's right after 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. It says this, For though, they, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. That's an important scripture to remember. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds or bondages. Casting down arguments... And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray for those that are looking for freedom, that today would be the day that they get their freedom. For, for those that may enjoy their bondage, I pray that their eyes would be open, that they don't have to live there anymore. May, may their, their taste buds be changed so that they don't like the bondage anymore, but they want the freedom that is offered through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I just pray for your loving hand upon each and every one here today and those listening online. In Jesus' name, amen. You can smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. So this is the final part to our series called Battle Plans. If you haven't watched the first two in this series, I would encourage you to take the time to go back and do so. You can find those on our website uh, or on our YouTube channel. 
The Lord is revealing to us through his word how we can live lives of victory in this world. So just a re quick recap from last week. We learned that the battle is not in the flesh. Say this with me. The battle is not in the flesh. Good. Thank you. I should have said repeat after me instead of say this with me because I said it and then you repeated it. Right. I'm learning. Hey, I'm learning. So the battle's not in the flesh. That is, we are in a battle of the spirit and soul, but we do not war with instruments of flesh. In other words, we aren't going to carry around real physical swords with us. The only physical sword that you carry around is your Bible. And hopefully you're hiding it in your heart. So our weapons are given to us by the Lord through his word. We looked at our battle weapons and our armor, part of our armor, I should say. The first thing was the helmet of salvation. This is the single most important piece of armor that we must adorn for without the helmet, we are already defeated. Without the helmet of salvation, you are already defeated. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. <clears throat> and our battle takes place in two of the three realms. It takes place in the soul and the spirit. And our battle victories and defeats can manifest in the physical realm. And the examples we gave were the demoniac at the, at the Gennesaret. When they, you know, they cast out a whole legion of demons from the guy. And the physical response was... The pigs running off into the off the cliff into the water and drowning, and then the man being set free and actually wearing clothing, which was a good thing. Okay, and we have the the deaf and dumb boy uh, that that uh, the, the disciples couldn't cast the devil out, and Jesus came and cast the devil out of him, and the boy fell down as he was dead. The people thought Jesus had done killed him. Said, Jesus, you killed him. He said no. He picked him up, and the boy could hear and speak from that point on. And then the third one was Philip casting out demons in Samaria. And when the demons came out of people, they came out screaming. There was a physical response to the spiritual battle. Are you with me? All right. We talked about the gospel of peace. Every time we preach Jesus, we shake the gates of hell. So this morning we'll continue to study our battle, uh, our battle uh, armament and plan. So point number one this morning is that the battle belongs to the Lord. Point number one, the battle, if you're writing notes, the battle belongs to the Lord. And if you're not writing notes, just commit it to memory. Ephesians 6.10 tells us, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Now, last week we discussed that we cannot physically beat a demon or the devil. We're no match physically against the enemy. That's why it's important that we understand that we put our trust in the Lord. We are to be strong in the Lord. And you may ask, how do we get strong in the Lord? Well, I'm glad you asked. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 in the message. I like the way this reads. It says, and that about wraps it up. God is strong and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you'll be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no weekend war that we'll fight away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. I like that. I thought that was pretty, pretty good visual picture there. This is a battle. We are in a battle, okay? The, the devil is a real enemy. There's, there's even pastors out there that preach that the devil's not real. That's a load of, of, of hogwash. The devil is real. He's a real being. He was created by God. He's a real being. He rebelled against the Father, and the Lord cast him out of heaven because of his pride. Our pride would tell us that we can beat the devil in our own strength. But the truth is we need that we're to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I'd much rather walk in the power of the might of the Lord than to try and do it myself. We get strong in the Lord by using the weapons given to us by God. This is called application. How many know that it's one thing to know something, it's another to apply something? Okay, it's one thing to know something, it's another to apply something. For example, if I get a cut on my finger, I know that a Band-Aid will help in the healing process. However, if I do not apply a Band-Aid to said finger, then it does not help. I managed to step on a splinter last week. Let me tell you, it did not feel good. I knew what I had done as soon as I had done it. We have old wood floor in our house in our dining, uh, I'm sorry, living room. And Pastor Jason will be refurnishing it or redoing it here after Christmas season once the tree comes down. Because we're going to have a, a granddaughter that's going to be crawling around on said floor. 
but I walked into my, uh, my I, we've got a couch, and I have a, a spot. You know, we're creatures of habit. You know, looking out, I can tell you that we are creatures of habit. I know when people are missing because we're creatures of habit. Y'all want to really mess with a pastor? Next week, switch it all up and sit somewhere different. I'll be like, what is going on? But I'm a creature of habit as well. It's not a bad thing. It's just the way we're designed. And I go to my spot. It's my spot on the couch. And I went to go sit down, and I had my socks on because my feet were cold. And I stepped, and I knew the very second what had happened. I said, oh, and I picked my foot up, and I saw sticking out of my sock a splinter about that long. I knew where the rest of it was. It was in my foot. So I pulled it out. And unfortunately, some of it stayed in my foot. Ever, ever had something like that happen to you? That's not fun. I mean, if it's on your list of things to do before Jesus comes back, scratch it off. So I tried to get to my right foot to get that splinter out. I don't know if you can tell or not, but I'm not the most flexible guy in the world. There's things in the way. And I tried getting that foot up, and I dug and dug and dug, and I could not get that little sliver out. I couldn't even see it. It got to a point, I was at desperation point, to the point where I was going to have my wife perform surgery on my foot. So I laid down on the couch. I said, baby, you got to help me out here because this hurts. I go to step, and I could feel the pain from that little sliver. I said, I can't see the sliver. Help me. So she proceeded to dig in my foot. I was a big boy. I didn't let any tears come from my eyes. But finally she said, I can't find it either. Those are words you don't want to hear. So I ended up taking a Band-Aid and some Neosporin and slapping it on there and praying, Father God, I can't get this splinter out of my foot. Can you help me out? Can you take this splinter out? He eventually answered my prayers, not as soon as I wanted, but he got it out, thankfully. But it was like two days later when it finally came out, and I was like, oh, hallelujah, it's healed. <laughs> Why am I talking about a splinter? Let's continue on. Oh, that's right, the Band-Aid. To know something and to apply something, there's a whole different thing. You can know to put the Band-Aid on the wound, but if you don't put the Band-Aid on the wound, it's not going to do you much good, is it? But I know what to do. I need to apply it. It's called application. Example number two, I'm attacked by the enemy with a lustful thought. The scripture comes to mind. Walk in the spirit and you will not satisfy the lusts of the flesh. That is knowing something. If somebody tells you that they're not tempted in any area of their life, they are lying to you. Every person gets tempted. Even Jesus himself got tempted in the wilderness. But you see... Jesus knew the scriptures, and then he applied the scriptures. That's where the difference is at. So it's kind of like if a bird wants to build a nest in your hair. You have two options. You can shoo him away, or you can let him build the nest. And how many know that birds are messy? You're going to get poo-poo on your head. So walk in the spirit. So lustful thought comes, and the thought comes then. Walk in the spirit, and you will not satisfy the lusts of the flesh, that is the knowing something, now I need to apply said something. I apply then by choosing to turn my mind to walking in the Spirit. Why? Because the command is, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So now I need to walk in the Spirit. I begin by praying in the Spirit and praying with my understanding. And this is part of walking in the Spirit. Then I begin singing in the Spirit, singing with my understanding. And this is part of walking in the Spirit. I purposely change my mind from darkness to to light. I'm purposely changing my thoughts or what I'm thinking about from said lust thought to good things, things from above, what the Father has. Because we know that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in heaven. Amen? So we know that, so then if a, a thought to, to lust comes to mind, then I'm going to start walking in the Spirit because the Scripture comes to mind. Walk in the Spirit, you will not satisfy the lust of the flesh. So I can walk in the Spirit, and then I won't be satisfying the lusts of the flesh. However, if you like your bondage, you're not going to do that. you got to understand, if we, if we want to get free, we got to purposely change our minds. We have to change our minds, and we do this through the Word. 
To be strong, I purposely change my mind from darkness to light. That is being strong in the Lord, walking in the power of his might. You see, the Lord is the one who baptized me with his spirit. The Lord is the one who has given me scriptures to combat the enemy. The Lord is the one who's given me authority and has given authority and weight to his word. And the Lord is the one who has the victory already planned out for me. And all I have to do is walk in it. And when we do these things, then we are fulfilling Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You see, he's given us everything that we need to be victorious in the battles that we face. Everything. What do you need? It can be met through the power of his word. Whatever need is there, whatever battle you are facing, the answer is in the word of God. The answer is the word of God. Point number two this morning. For those of you that are taking notes, equip the weapons. Equip the weapons. Last week, we discussed equipping the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and the gospel of peace. So we're going to move on to the rest. Ephesians 6, 12 and 13. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Thank you, Jesus. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand and you know the rest stand therefore. I want you to notice something. When you look at the, the armor of God, when you look at everything, you've got the helmet of salvation, right? Which covers the head. You've got the breastplate of righteousness. You've got the sword of the spirit. You shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You put on the belt of truth uh, and you have the shield of faith. Nothing in there protects the backside, The reason being is because we weren't designed for retreat. We were designed to go into battle headlong against the enemy. And God gave us everything we need in order to be victorious over the battles of the enemy. Amen? Oh, glory. A big takeaway from the verses I just read is the command to put on all of the armor of God. Do not be content with just the helmet of salvation. You look silly in battle running around with just a helmet on. Let's look at the full list again. Ephesians 6, 14 through 18. Stand therefore, having gird your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which with you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We have to put it on. If you want to be victorious, you got to put it on. You can't go in naked into the battle. battle. you got to put it on, which means effort and time on our part. We've got to spend time in the Word and spend time in His presence. Point number three this morning, the belt of truth. In order to not be deceived, you must know the truth. The example for this is bank tellers. Bank tellers do not study counterfeits. They study the real thing. That way, when a counterfeit passes through their hands, they immediately know something is amiss. But you must be well-versed in what is real in order to, be, in order to spot the fake. You see, the enemy, if you're just going to study the fakes, the enemy will continue to send fakes to you all the time. And you aren't going to know what the truth is. But what you have to do is study the truth instead. That way, when the, when the fake comes across, you'll know, mm, something ain't right here. They study the real thing. They know what, you know, if, if the bill's supposed to have a, a security strip or a holographic image or something on General Washington's nose, and whatever it may be, they, they know what to look for. And if it doesn't have those things, then, they, then immediately something in their, in their mind says something's not right about this bill, and they can examine it further and find out whether or not it's real. It's really cool. It's a neat process. And it's a truth here for us as well. If people will study their Bibles, they won't fall for things like David Koresh. For those of you that don't know what that was, you can look at your history books and find out Waco, Texas, or Waco, depending on how you say it. You won't fall for, for, for the, the false gospels and false narratives. You won't fall for... False messages. I've had people come up and say, hey, uh, I believe this is a word from the Lord. They give you something off the wall. 
Thank you. Let me shelf that right over here. But then when you get a real word from the Lord, it lines up with what God has already been speaking to you in your spirit. Belt of truth. Be on your guard against deception. Paul addressed the church in Corinth about false prophets and the like, 2 Corinthians 11, 12 through 15. Well, what I do, I will also do continue, continue to do, continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be false, uh, regarded as just as who are. Let me back this up and try it again. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if, he ministers, if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Had Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon uh, church, cult, whatever you want to call it, actually read his Bible, then he would have known that the angel called Moroni was actually a demon from hell sent to deceive him. Listen, if a teaching or a word that you receive does not line up with the written of word of God, throw it out. The problem with deception is that it is deceptive. It's deceiving. Many Christians open the door to the devil and his demons because they are deceived. Ooh, I can't wait to watch this movie, participate in this game, or read this book because it's just fake. No, it's a deceptive trap from the devil, and you are deceived. You continue to open the door to him and wonder why you can't get free from name that issue. The problem is we open up the door through, through all kinds of different things called entertainment. Well, it's just a movie. Listen, Satan doesn't spend money on things if he can't deceive you with it. It's just a book. Again, Satan's not going to invest the time into these things if he can't try to deceive you with it. It's, it's just a, and, and name that thing. We have to be on our guard. Why? Because when we're being entertained, we, we drop our guard and things start to creep in. It's a, this is a spiritual principle. Things enter our heart through our eyes and our ears, okay? So when we put things in our eyes and our ears, it eventually drops down into our heart. And out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And this is why we have to be careful on what we put in our eyes and our ears. It's not a legalistic approach. It's just a matter of, okay, let's be careful on what we look at. Let's be careful on what we listen to, what we're putting on the inside. All right, I won't meddle there anymore. Why do we need the belt of truth? I'm glad you asked. Because it keeps us from being deceived. It keeps us from falling into a trap. The belt also holds up the rest of the armor. Therefore, if the belt is holding everything else up, then it keeps us from tripping all over ourselves in the midst of battle. Because you, you don't want to trip when you're running. Amen? All right. Number four point this morning, the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate is designed to protect a vital organ, your heart, your blood pump. When we choose to put on the righteousness of Christ, then we are protecting our heart to the inside of us. Righteousness can be translated right standing with God. And that only comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. Once we have applied the blood then we need to walk in the paths of righteousness that the Lord has prepared for us. So what does it mean to walk in righteous paths that the Lord has prepared for us? I'm glad you asked. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Walking in righteousness is to do God's will for our lives. Walking in righteousness is to live by faith, not fear. Walking in righteousness is to be obedient to God's commands. Walking in righteousness is to take care of the sick, the widows, and the orphans. It's to love each other. That'll preach. It's to forgive one another. Ooh, there's another good one. Walking in righteousness is to evangelize the lost. When we're wearing the breastplate of righteousness, then it helps to protect our hearts from offense and the attacks of the enemy. There's... One of the greatest weapons of the enemy is through offense or offense, however you want to say it. If you get offended at somebody, offense, off, it leads to, to bitterness, which leads to hatred, which leads to murder of the heart, which leads to, to sin, which leads to death. 
So if the enemy can get you offended in one way or another, then you've just opened the door to him. And this is where forgiveness is important for us as believers. And again, forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a decision. Because your emotions, it'll take, it'll take time for your emotions to line up for what you decided to do. And that day will come. But the decision needs to make, be made. I choose to forgive so-and-so for what they did. Because I want to be forgiven by my Father in heaven what I've done against him. Amen? I love hearing them. Number five this morning, shield of faith. We're, on, we're getting close to the end. The shield of faith puts out the fiery darts of the enemy. We are in a battle for our lives here, folks. The enemy shoots flaming arrows at us, but God has given us a shield of faith. What is the shield of faith? I'm so glad that you asked. You guys are asking some great questions this morning. When the enemy comes in against us and we stand on God's word by faith, we believe that his word works. We don't say, well, I sure hope God's word works, but rather by faith, we believe that his word works. By faith, we quote the scriptures that apply to our situation. By faith, we activate the shield of faith when we purposely do these things because we know that faith without works is dead. And as we act out in our faith and the fiery darts of the wicked one are extinguished, you will get fiery darts from the wicked one. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you are serving the Father in heaven, you will get fiery darts fired at you. However, God has given you something that you have in your arsenal, and it is the shield of faith. And you can put out those fiery darts through the word of God. Good news, folks. There's some coffee in there if anybody needs it, by the way. It's just, just checking. I made it, so I have no idea what it tastes like. It may be the worst coffee you've ever had. It'll definitely wake you up, though, right? Glory. I want to give you an example. A, a great evangelist got up on stage and began walking back and forth. And at each end, he would say, he'd walk over to one side and he'd stop. And he'd say, faith is an act. And then he walked over to the other side while he was, he didn't say anything else, but he just walked over on this side and he said, faith is an act. And he did this back and forth and people began to get up and leave. And, and, and then all of a sudden after people stopped leaving, someone finally understood and it clicked that faith is an act. It is an action. People began getting up out of wheelchairs and miracles broke out all across the auditorium. Why? Because faith is an act. When we truly have faith, then we will act. We will act like that's what our faith is calling forth. Amen? So faith is an action. If you have faith, you will say, that's in the words, if you say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea. And if you do not doubt, but believe those things that you sayeth, you shall have whatsoever you sayeth. Therefore, I say unto you, right? You say, do these things. Faith is an act. Hallelujah. Glory. Let me tell you a story about Smith Wigglesworth. If you've never studied his life, he's, man, what a fascinating. God took a plumber and used him for his glory. An unsaved, illiterate plumber and used him for his glory. Smith Wigglesworth got saved. He learned how to read by reading the Bible only. And that was the only thing he would let in his house was the Bible. And then by faith, he would go out and hold crusades. And um, while Smith Wigglesworth was staying at the home of a curate of the local church of England, Wigglesworth and the curate were sitting together uh, talking after supper. No doubt the subject of their conversation was that the poor fellow, poor fellow had no legs. Artificial limbs in those days were unlike the sophisticated limbs of today. Wigglesworth said to the man quite suddenly, which he often did when ministering in cases like this, he told the man, go and get a, new pair, a pair of new shoes in the morning, just out of the blue. The poor fellow thought it must be some kind of joke. However, after Wigglesworth and the curate had retired to their respective rooms that night, God said to the curate, do as my servant hath said. What a designation for any person, my servant. God was identifying himself with Wigglesworth. There was no more sleep for that man that night. He rose up early, went downtown, and stood, I think it's funny they used the word stood, stood waiting for the shoe shop to open. The manager eventually arrived and opened the door of the shop for business, and the curate went in and sat down. Presently, the assistant came and said, good morning, sir, how can I, can I help you? The man said, yes. Would you get me a pair of shoes, please? Yes, sir. Size and color? The man hesitated. The assistant then saw his condition and said, Sorry, sir, we can't help you. 
It's all right, young man, but I do want a pair of shoes, size 8, color black. The assistant went to get the requested shoes. A few minutes later, he returned and handed them to the man. The man put one stump into the shoe and instantly a foot and leg formed. Then the same thing happened with the other leg. He walked out of the shop, not only with a new pair of shoes, but also with a new pair of legs. Wigglesworth was not surprised. He had expected the result. He often made remarks like this. As far as God is concerned, there's no difference between forming a limb and healing a broken bone. I hope that gets your faith up. In order for us to use the shield of faith, we must act. That means applying the word of God to every attack of the enemy. Some complain when the enemy attacks and say things like, why doesn't God do something about my situation? Newsflash, God already did something for your situation. He gave you the word of God and a sound mind, and it's time to use both. Don't just sit there. Do something. Faith is an act, and it's time to act out what we truly believe. I'd like for Bruce and the praise team to join me on the stage this morning. And I pray that you're, already, you're ready to move by faith this morning. I pray that you're ready to move in faith, by faith, to get that faith up. So what do you need? What battles are you facing? This is our final sermon in this series. What battles are you facing? What is that situation? Is it a problem with lust? Is it a problem with, with, with uh, uh, an addiction of some sort, uh, whether it be uh, uh, cigarettes or, or you have an addiction to... Uh, I don't, whatever, name that problem, drugs, alcohol, any type of abuse. Are you having problems with, with thoughts of, of ending your life? Can I tell you something? God loves you. He cares about you. You have a plan and a purpose. God has a plan and a purpose for your life that you don't need to end it. Rather, that's a, ending your life is a lie straight from the pit of hell. That is something the devil wants you to do because he knows if he can take you out of the way, then he's got one less person to deal with on this earth. That's the only thing the devil wants for you is to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you, and not necessarily in that order. So by all means, understand the word of God that you are precious in his sight, that God saw you, Jesus saw you on the cross 2,000 years ago, looking forward to this day here in 2021. He saw you sitting in this place. He saw you watching online. He knows you. He knows every hair on your head. You are valuable to him. Understand the word and use it to fight against those fiery darts of the wicked one. Use it to fight against the fiery darts of depression. God has prepared words for you in his word so that you can live free from these things. Pastor Jason, you're making bold statements. Absolutely, because I believe them to be true. I believe the word of God is true. And let God be true and every man a liar. What do you need this morning? What kind of victory would just make your day? What kind of victory would make your day? I have a question. Will you act on it? Would you please stand with me? Will you come to the altar and believe God for the victory? You see, faith is an act. Faith is an act. Will you step out this morning and give God the glory? And as we open the altar this morning, let us be a reminder of the one, in the first, one of the first scriptures we looked at, Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Would you come this morning and be strong in the Lord in the power of his might?
Those of you that are on home listening online, go ahead and stretch your hand towards that uh, the screen. Father God, we're believing you for the victory plans, and I thank you for giving us the right words in the hour that we need to use them and to say them. I thank you for giving us the right uh, shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Lord, we thank you for the victory ahead of time. In Jesus' name, I thank you for walking with us, guiding and directing us, and, and we just give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you for coming this morning. You're dismissed. We'll, uh, do not, we won't see you tonight because uh, we have no services tonight. We'll see you uh, later. Have a good night.